Broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here is your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour, where our mission is to help our listeners become better investors. How about that? I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, a value investing service published by Stansberry Research. All right, it's time for the rant. It's time for me to rant and roll. Now, I know that many of you insist on doing short-term trading, even though I've kind of tried to warn you away from it. And frankly, I think a great many of you have absolutely no idea how badly the odds are stacked against you, too. Um, That's the thing that, you know, it it almost keeps me up at night about our readers and our listeners. Uh, My whole career has been spent trying to help people make money in the stock market and and not lose it and not give it away in commissions and fees and things. Um, but now, you know, I've got um, I've got a lot of time and, you know, more than two decades of experience and age and wisdom and stuff in this business behind me. And, and um, I'm just getting to this idea where I'm realizing that the stock market is simply outside the circle of competence of most people and will probably remain so for their entire lives. They should, you know, they should do something else with that time. But I'm not going to harp on that. OK, I'm just going to say it now and then. And I realize there are just lots of people listening to the sound of my voice every week who insist on doing short-term trading, okay? Um, you know, you're sure you're going to hit it big. You're, you insist on buying options even though you have no idea like how they're priced or what their many dimensions really are. So if you insist on doing this thing called trading where you're in and you're out in a day or an hour or a week or even a month sometimes, um, it's still really short-term. Today, I offer you my biggest, most essential principle about engaging in the risky behavior known as trading. So if all your trading begins and ends with this one principle, I believe you're far, far less likely to blow up and much, much more likely to make at least some money. This is not a recipe for getting rich, okay? This is not what that's about. This is not a system. We're not talking about signals and buying and selling or any of that. Frankly, all that stuff is worthless. It's worth a lot more to Wall Street than it is to you. They love it because most of those strategies are really just random number generators. They're random. Uh, when you get down to it. And so Wall Street loves you trading random strategies so they can generate commissions. That's their retirement plan is for you to trade random strategies. Okay. So last week I told you the odds were against you. You know, the competition is huge, enormously well-financed, and they have this big advantage that you'll never have. As Carl Sagan might put it, your competition for trading profits has billions and billions of dollars that they can use to push the market where they want it to go. You know, a lot of the time, enough of the time to matter. Um, You can't do that. And in fact, you're probably totally unaware of when and how much, you know, you're being pushed around by these folks. Of course, we begin this this, uh, rant towards this trading principle of mine. We define things negatively. We begin by defining negatively, like what you shouldn't do. And that's... Frankly, negative action is like one of the great secrets of great traders, what you shouldn't do, what you don't do. Um, And the one and only thing that matters really is not how much money you make, right? That's that's the negative definition I'm talking about. The, the, The important number one principle is not about making money. Okay. In fact, you should never expect to make much as a trader. You should expect to lose most of the time. Even the best traders will tell you that. So what's this one thing? What's the principle? What's he getting at? What is this one thing that separates great traders from the rest? Here it is. One word. Survival. 
survival, survival, survival. Real estate is about location, location, location. Trading, no matter what anyone on this earth anywhere ever tells you, is about survival, survival, survival. Survival is your absolute number one objective, your number one consideration. Good traders survive. Great ones survive and hit a few home runs. Comedian Woody Allen famously said 80% of success is showing up. You can't show up if you don't survive. In a similar vein, trader and author Nassim Taleb, in his book Skin in the Game, makes the point that uh, he was talking about doing science. He says, to do science, you must survive. But he notes that the human race survived without science for a long time. So science isn't necessary for survival. But you must survive to do science. You have to survive to do anything, Right. Taleb criticizes certain regulators and researchers who he says they, quote, have no clue about probability and tried to disrupt our efficient organic paranoias. Efficient organic paranoia. I love that. That's your fear of losing money, your fear of not surviving. Use it in your favor. Okay. And what do all the greats say? Warren Buffett, you know, Ray Dalio, George Soros, whoever it is, or like the market wizards, you read those books, market wizards, it's all the same message. Warren Buffett says, don't lose, rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, see rule number one, right? It's a negative definition focused on survival. Charlie Munger says, we just try to not be stupid, right? Because we don't want to end up in the, you know, Darwin Awards, right? Survival. Ray Dalio says, most people need to know when not to take a bet. Negative definition focused on survival. George Soros says, I'm wrong all the time, but I always correct myself. You know, he's, he's wrong. He's always he's defining things negatively, right? Oh, this is not it. This is not it. Except he does it with real money, you know? And then he finds it by correcting himself because he wants to survive and not do the wrong thing. And what did the market wizards say? They all say the same thing. I could probably, you, you, if I were standing in front of you in a crowd, you could probably all recite it to me. It's five words. Cut losses, let winners run, right? That's what all those market wizards books say. They all say the same thing. And in that order, it's always that order. Cut losses, let winners run. You know why it's in that order? Because you have to cut losses to survive before you're going to have a winner that you can let run. And cutting losses and letting winners run, by the way, is the exact same thing. It's just a systematic way of exiting. Oh, we're down, you know, whatever your stop is. If your stop is 9.5%, oh, we're down 9.5%, we're out. We're up, we're up, we're up, we're up, we're up, we're up, we're staying in, we're letting our winners run. Oh, then we're down 9.5% from the top, we're letting, you know, we're, we're out. It's all the same thing. And it's all based on survival. Survival is your absolute number one, rock bottom, non-negotiable, essential prerequisite for even calling yourself a trader as far as I'm concerned, because if you don't survive, you won't be a trader anymore. Now, survival is a frequent topic of conversation where I live here in the great northwestern United States, because every year somebody dies climbing one of these mountains around here. Uh, there's a wonderful book called Deep Survival, Who Lives, Who Dies, and Why?, by Lawrence Gonzalez. And Lawrence Gonzalez tells the story, in fact, of the uh, terrible May 30th, 2002 disaster that occurred on Mount Hood, which is, I, I can't see it out my window here, but if you drive up the road a little ways and get out of the way of the trees, it's out on a sunny day like today all the time. Anyway, on May 30, 2002, nine climbers fell. Three of them died, including one guy who'd never climbed a mountain before. Ugh. It was horrible. Uh, then, and what happened was, you know, these rope systems where everybody's kind of tethered together, the one thing that can happen is the, the top guy, the guy at the top cannot fall, period, the end. It cannot happen. If he's got 30 or I think it was like 35 feet of slack on this one, 35 or 40 feet, so if he's got 35 feet of slack, just say, he's got to fall 70 feet. A 200-pound man falling 70 feet. Is he going to rip the other three, four, five people off the mountain with him? He sure, he sure will, and that's exactly what happened. You know, the one thing that must not happen. So, you know, people didn't survive. Um, shortly after the accident, the head of the Mount Hood Ski Patrol told Lawrence Gonzalez, the guy who wrote this book, he said, quote, this mountain is just not taken seriously. 
fat people go up there, end quote. Wow. It's, it's um, about 10,000 people a year climb Mount Hood. On average, one of them dies every year, sometimes referred to as a beginner's mountain. But there's no such thing as a beginner's mountain. It's a technical climb. You need ice picks, you know, ice axes and crampons and all the right stuff and ropes and everything. Uh, you know, you, you, ha you have to do these things to survive. And it, there's no beginner's mountain. There's no beginner's market. You know, it's life or death every second you're in it. As long as you're in it, you must know how to survive. And knowing how to survive is a funny thing, isn't it? You can't have the experience of dying a few times. You must survive, period. In the novel Taylor Tinker, Soldier Spy by John le Carré, he writes, survival is an infinite capacity for suspicion. So maybe succeeding in, you know, and surviving in financial markets is about maintaining a healthy level of suspicion about every position you put on. Because most of them are going to be losers, so you better be suspicious, right? You better be ready to cut and run. And, and, and if you're not suspicious enough, listen to last week's rant. That, that'll help in the suspicion department. So what should you actually do? What is this survival? I've said survive 50 million times and told you about this mountain and, and, and people dying and stuff. What, what, what should you actually do? Well, there's a bunch of practical techniques and tricks that traders use to help ensure their survival. Trailing stops is the popular one at Stansberry. Until recently, I was the only Stansberry editor not to use them. Then I was shown some data a few years ago that indicated I'd have done better with them than without, without them, and I eventually had to give in and start using them. There are other reasons why I do that, which I explain to people who read my newsletter. Not important here. Position sizing is another one, okay? That's when you decide you're only going to risk, you know, 1% or 2% or some certain percentage of your capital on a given trade. I've used this one in extreme value from the very beginning. Value investors, of course, use the margin of safety technique to try to survive their trades, right? That's when you buy a stock for less than the intrinsic value of the business. Another one is diversification, right? That's where you, you're truly diversified only if portions of your portfolio maintain value or grow or maybe just shrink a tiny bit when other portions are getting hammered, right? Otherwise, your assets are all said to be correlated, right, if they're all going up and down together. And it's harder to be diversified than most people think. We that's was a big lesson we all learned, wasn't it? In 2008, everything fell, except for Walmart. I was recommending Walmart at the time. The thing went up 21% that year. Uh, you know, and we've heard, we, other than those techniques, we've all heard various rules of thumb about this, right? Don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? That's diversification. Another one says, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket carefully. Remember, we talked about circle of competence. We quoted Andrew Carnegie, and he said, you know, you should really kind of put all your eggs in the one basket of your career and focus all your capital on the thing, the business you really know that you do every day. That's a version of putting all your eggs in one basket and watching it carefully. So, you know, these are some techniques and tricks, but I don't want to give you a list of these things. That, there's your list. If you need a list, there it is. But that's not really what I'm going to tell you. What I'm going to tell you is the very single best one of these tips and tricks I've ever heard, the one that separates the heroes from the zeros, right, the great traders from the rest, is this. This is what you can actually do with real money. It's, it's not really specific. You'll have to work it out for yourself in the details. But here it is. Only bet bigger when you're ahead Never, ever, ever when you're behind, right? If you've lost on your last 10 trades, you have to keep just keeping your bets small, your initial bet size, right? It's only when you start winning that you have any business increasing the size of the bet. And Nassim Taleb says that this has been practiced by every trader. He said probably every trader who's ever survived. You can read about it towards the end of Skin in the Game, which I recommend you do read that book. Read all his stuff. It's incredible. He says this is like flipping a switch. You make a profit, you bet bigger. You lose money, you bet smaller, or maybe not at all for a while. Stanley Druckenmiller, very, very famous successful trader who has more than survived, once said that at a certain point in his career, things weren't going well. He didn't feel he had earned the right, he said, to bet big on a particular idea with his and his client's money. That phrase resonated with me. It made sense. 
He also made the point that he tended to bet smaller when he felt he was uh, what he called out of step with the market and bigger when he felt he was in step. And how did he know he was in step? Because he was winning. Okay, he was up. Obviously, these are really, like I said, a subjective criterion, uh, criteria. I've just given you a couple things. But it's so it's up to you to try to figure out how to turn this in a, into action. But those are the principles. Absolutely, positively. I personally do engage in some of this small short-term trading stuff now and then. For that part of my portfolio, I follow these two ironclad rules, principles, whatever you want to call them. Survive, survive, survive is number one. Survival, survival, survival. And number two is bet big only when you're ahead, never when you're behind. Right. So, you know, when I when you trade, you, right, it's like I'd love to earn the right to bet bigger, but I have to survive first and I have to make then I have to make money. Then I've earned the right to bet bigger. So there's really two things involved. Right. Got to survive. Got to make some money. Then you can bet bigger until then you're betting small. That's my rant. Survive. Bet big only when you're ahead, never when you're behind. See, I could have just said that from the very beginning. That would have been the whole rant because it saved a lot of time. <laughs> And I thought about that, you know, I thought about that in doing this, but we humans are funny, you know, we, 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 we've, I've seen market research and we've talked about this internally in some meetings where people just have to spend a certain amount of money on certain things before they feel like they've done it enough, which is kind of silly, you know, and that's, so that's how they price all kinds of things, you know, like uh, exercise equipment and cars and various things. Uh, well, maybe not cars so much, but I know they do it for like exercise equipment. People have to spend a certain amount of money, especially on, you know, these um, sort of extracurricular activities and hobbies and things like that. Um, and so the and but and they need to hear a certain amount of a story told about something before they'll sort of think it's worth it's worth, um, you know, ingesting and and making a part of their thinking. So that's why I didn't tell you those two things right off the bat. Okay. I made you go through all that rigmarole. That's the rant. Let me know what you think by emailing us at feedback and investorhour.com. So let's see what's new right now. And, you know, I got to tell you, I, I tried to take over the what's new, but uh, my producer, Justin Mattis does such a fine, fine job of it. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to let him do it because every week, even when I said I was going to do it, he's like, okay, well, I'll just send it to you anyway. And it's really good. First off the bat here, actually, the, I, I do want to start with a couple things before I get to these news items. First thing is we have this thing called Stansberry Newswire. You can go to stansberrynewswire.com, put in your email, and it's like this free newswire run by Stansberry, by Scott Garlis, Greg Diamond, John Gillen. They, they, and you can read all of their bios at stansberrynewswire.com. They've been there and done that and managed billions of dollars and all kinds of stuff. And they're doing this every day. And it's awesome because I didn't realize it's free. Anybody can get it. So there's that, stansberrynewswire.com. Second, we talk a lot about Tesla and I see, let's see, Justin has not given me, given me a Tesla uh, news item today. So I will tell you, go on to CNBC.com and search for a guy named um, William Smith from Blaine Capital. William Smith from Blaine Capital. And there's a video, it's like not even two minutes, and it's the best sort of quick summing up of the Tesla situation if you want to kind of get up to speed with it and, and get it Tesla in a nutshell. William Smith, Blaine Capital, CNBC.com. All right, here's the news. First of all, we have this odd situation. This is going to be a weird lunch. Okay, Warren Buffett does this thing every year where he auctions off lunch with, with himself because everybody wants to have lunch with the richest guy around. Um, and it goes for millions of dollars. This year, um, the, the winner paid uh, $4.57 million to have lunch with Warren Buffett. And the winner, he was, an, he was anonymous at first, but then they, they, they told us who it is. His name is Justin Soon. 
And he's the 28-year-old founder of two companies called Tronix and Piwo. He's a cryptocurrency pioneer, okay? And he's going to have lunch with Warren Buffett. Why is that funny? Because Warren Buffett... He, when he was asked about Bitcoin, he said, it's probably rat poison squared. It's like, hi, Justin, thank you for your $4.6 million donation to the Glide Foundation. You've spent your whole career on something that's rat poison squared. So, boy, you know, um, as Bloomberg said in their article, oh, to be a fly on the wall when these two get together. It's going to be awkward. <laughs> anyway, um, so... Alphabet shares fell 6% earlier this week when the Justice Department, uh, it was reported the Justice Department is preparing a, 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 a Google antitrust probe, right? Google's been hit with these billion dollar fines uh, in, the, in the European Union, at billion euro fines, I should say, in the European Union, um, paying multi-billions of dollars of fines. And now the Justice Department says they're going to do an antitrust probe. What do we think of this? Let me tell you how to think about this. I think I know how to think about this. First of all, do not waste time unless you're really there, that kind of person with thinking about whether or not it ought to be broken up. You know, people have all these political views about these things. Just think about what you would do as an investor if it is broken up. So if it is broken up, is that good? Or if it's not broken up, is that good? Look, if it's not broken up, Google's still going to gush cash flow. It's just going to gush free cash flow. It's an amazing business, right? Between them and Facebook, it's like 90% of all the money going into online advertising. If they are broken up, that could be really good too, right? When Standard Oil was broken up, I think it was broken up into like 34 companies. And, you know, if you had held on to them all... Um, you would have done pretty well. And, and of course, then they recombined after a while too. Um, but what happens is when they break something up and then you, you know, you essentially are given all the spinoffs of, of the breakup um, as a shareholder of, of Alphabet. So, you know, you'll get Google and YouTube and what's the other thing, Waymo and, and maybe a few other things. But what will happen is the market will put a valuation on those other pieces. And right now they're inside, so you can't really know. They don't break out a whole separate, you know, set of reports for those businesses. And and I would bet YouTube is worth a lot, right? You can go in there. There's so much video. It's like the Library of Congress being uploaded every 10 seconds or something like that. I don't know what the time frame is. It could be 10 minutes. Uh, but But it's a huge amount of video being loaded onto that thing all the time. And they have, you know, YouTube, I forget what they call it, YouTube Prime or something. You can pay to get a really good version of it that doesn't have um, ads, I think. So it's really cool. Um, and that could get a, that could get a, a, very likely, I believe, would get a higher valuation if it were spun off as a separate company. And who knows, you know, another thing that happens in spinoffs is that you, you unlock some kind of uh, pent up, entrepreneurial oomph that was kind of locked inside this bigger company. And, and you know, the, the guy running YouTube has to do what uh, Larry and Sergey tell him to, right? They has to do what the, what the folks running the thing tell him to. But if he's a separate company, he doesn't have to do that. So his, his entrepreneurial um, tendencies will be kind of unleashed in, in a greater way. And that could be very good. I suspect for a platform like you two, you know, you could probably get a monkey running this thing and it would be the most wonderful thing in the world, right? That was the old the old uh, Peter Lynch thing, right? You want a business so great that a monkey could run it, it'd still be a great business. All right. Next, we have um, something which doesn't surprise me at all. And I hope I said this before. If I didn't shame on me, I should have said it. Nestle is gearing up to launch its own plant-based burger in the United States. It's called the Sweet Earth brand. It'll launch this fall. World's largest food company, right? They know what they're doing when it comes to food. That's how they got to be the largest. Uh, and they're going to sell, they already sell a soy-based vegan burger in Europe. But the Sweet Earth version will be 
based on pea proteins, just like the new company that went public recently, Beyond Meat. And it went it went public and soared. I don't even know. I, I, I should have checked this, darn it. But it's trading for tens and tens and tens of times revenues. And that's all you need to know. Because if it's more than 10 times, it's already crazy. But I think it's up to like 50 or 60 times. And it, and it loses money. And obviously, this is a highly competitive thing. Obviously, if Nestle can just get right into the business, well, you know, what's the Beyond Meat IP, the intellectual property, really worth? If somebody can just go create a pea protein-based burger to compete with them, uh, well, maybe, you know, there's nothing really going on there at Beyond Meat. It's just another IPO that's got a kind of a neat idea, maybe one whose time has come. The stock has soared beyond all reason, but what is it? It's a highly competitive, low margin thing with no competitive advantage whatsoever. How's that going to turn out for a brand new company? Not well, right? It's, it's, it's a similar complaint that I've expressed about Tesla, right? Capital intensive, low margin, highly competitive, no pricing power, brand new company with new technology. People who have never made cars before competing with people who have made cars and know how not to send a, a product to market before it's ready, which Tesla has clearly done. Right? So anyway, beyond me, lots of the competition is coming out of the woodwork and the competition is well financed and large and doesn't need that product to succeed, right? Beyond Meat needs its pea protein product to succeed because that's all they got. What else do we got? We got Bank of America says, here comes the recession panic, um, you know, and we just look at what the market has done kind of recently and uh, you know, stocks fell like five or six percent or whatever it was in the month of May. Ten-year treasuries hit an, the the yield for the ten-year treasury hit a new twenty-month low. Um, and all three recessions we note, uh, or or Bank of America notes in their recent report, all three recessions took place um, within three months of the first rate cut after a hiking cycle. And we've been talking about this at Stansberry um, for some time. We've been saying the recession is on its way, um, it, you know, for no other reason, just because that's the way it works. You know, cycles matter. Cycles happen. Um, and you better be, you better learn how to prepare for them. So, and we've talked, I've talked about preparing in the newsletter and, you know, holding cash and every now and then shorting stocks and holding puts every now and then. Um, but, but it's, it's. It's happening. It's a it's a good question at this point um, in the cycle. I don't, I'm not talking about short term bounces in the market or anything. I'm talking about the long cycle. You know, we we start with, you know, like March 2009, the last big bottom in this epic bull run. And so when you know bull runs, bull markets don't last forever. Eventually, things turn the other way, and we're kind of getting to that point. In fact, IPOs like Beyond Meat soaring beyond all you know reason uh, is kind of one of the signs that things may be turning, and and interest rates doing what the ten year has done. It's a sign that things could be turning. All right, it's time for our interview, and this week our, our interview subject is Mr. Ken Lewis. And Ken Lewis is a results-oriented professional with more than 20 years of leadership experience across a broad range of retail and technology organizations, many of which are in the Fortune 500. His strategic and operational changes have resulted in growing both the top and bottom lines of an organization. Mr. Lewis recognizes the importance of taking care of our customers while showing a deep commitment to the development of employees. Mr. Lewis joined Atmex in 2011 as EVP of operations, followed by two years as chief operating officer. Ken Lewis, welcome to the program, sir. Hey, thank you for the time. Look forward to it. You bet. Yeah. So, Ken, why don't you tell us... Um, how you got into the business of, of uh, how should we say, trading gold and silver bullion on the internet? 
You know, it's funny, man. It's just by chance, really. I was uh, I was at Home Depot prior, Microsoft prior to that. I've uh, really been an operations executive running supply chain type operations and had a recruiting firm. Uh, they were looking to take Atmex public at the time and uh, had a great opportunity to come in and, um, and, and play an important role in that process and uh, jumped at the opportunity. I've always been in really large companies, and I love the entrepreneur spirit that comes with small companies and the impacts you can make, and it uh, seemed like a fantastic opportunity. Unfortunately, you probably know the equities markets in 12 didn't didn't perform as well as we had liked, so we didn't go public, but uh, has been a great run ever since. Why don't you tell us what AppMex is? I'm, I'm betting that most of our listeners aren't familiar with AppMex. You know, we're, we're a 19-year-old company um, started by a gentleman named Scott Thomas. Um, back in the day, he, he really was a, you know, a coin shop type operation, and he had the idea of taking this thing online. And, um, you know, we pretty much doubled revenues for many years and um, hit about a peak of about a billion two in volume. What we do is, is we like to call ourselves the Amazon for precious metals. We, we take orders online. We, we uh, have a really broad assortment online for consumers. We're fairly priced. We try to ship same day to our customers and just provide a great customer experience. And, um, and you know, we ship via FedEx, UPS, uh, you know, U.S. Postal Service. So you're getting a product delivered to your home. And that just happens to be gold and silver. Okay, cool. The Amazon for precious metals. That's pretty simple, right? <laughs> I think so, yeah. So you guys have a, what is it, a joint venture with Sprott called OneGold.com? Yeah, we, you know, it's funny. I mean, our, our business has always been physical. And um, and we we were working with a company called Tradewind. I believe you've talked to Frazier before. And uh, and then Sprott, Peter, the CEO of there. And we kind of got together and the three of us said, you know, we think there's a great opportunity for a digital product uh, for the marketplace that deals with gold and silver. You know, our goals going into it is we really want to make gold and silver available to the masses. And when you look at how crypto and, and some of those concepts were performing with the with the digital platforms, we felt we could do it better uh, without the regulatory risk that comes with a, a crypto product. And so, yeah, we've partnered with, uh, we've formed a new company called OneGold, who's uh, basically a sister company of Atmex. And um, Sprott's an investor into that, into that operation. We're using Tradewind blockchain technology for one of the products we're selling. And, uh, yeah, we built a beautiful front end that um, I think consumers, once they use it, are going to find that it's very straightforward, very simple, very transparent. And, and we hope that will grow the demand for, for precious metals over time. Yeah, so you can just uh, – I mean, there's like – what's what's the minimum that I could open a one gold account with? Believe it or not, and, and it's important. I know we'll talk about how the product works, but um, what's beautiful about it is you can buy to three decimal places. I mean, you, you can basically, when you open an account with one gold, we actually give you $5 to play with where you can go out and do trades, do buys, do sells, see how it is to use, and you can invest a buck and you can buy gold or silver. Believe it or not, it's that simple. Forty uh, percent of our transactions, Dan, are, are actually people who are doing reoccurring transactions where they come and they say, you know what, I want a dollar cost average. I want to buy five dollars in gold a day for the next uh, six months, and our system will execute the trade for you real time every morning. Wow, I had no, I I didn't know that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's uh. You know, your brokerage accounts have kind of brought these concepts to the market, and we felt, frankly, we felt it very, very important to make it simple. So when you, you have a security, two-factor authorization, email confirmation, you have security on the front end, but you also have the ability to do things like link your bank account. So that example I just gave you, you could take $5 out of your bank account daily. It will pull the funds directly from your bank account once you link them. Uh, we're using a third-party software to do that. Once you link them, pulls the five dollars over, executes the trade, and you're and you're good to go. You never do anything but set the trade up on the beginning. Um, so we've made it very very simple and very economical. You can buy silver at four cents over spot. You can buy gold at just over three dollars over spot. You can't really take a position in metal any cheaper than this digital product. And more importantly, unlike some of the uh, the ETF products that are out there, it's 100% backed in gold at all times. It doesn't trade at a premium or discount to gold. It trades true up to what the spot's doing in the market. Um, and you can actually redeem. So some people love the idea of, of investing digitally, and they say, you know what, I'd like to buy a gold eagle now with my digital metal. We will allow you to do that, and then we ship the product to your home as soon as, uh, as, soon as you place the order. Okay. Now, Ken, I think a good way to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of this uh, might be to address the reader questions that I mentioned uh, before we started talking. 
So yeah, I, I, so I think I think you'll be able to clear up a lot of concerns that that are, I say readers, listeners, our listeners are our readers too. <laughs> so let's see it. So let's start with this fellow here. He's got um, a complaint that I've heard from other folks. He said, I've opened an account with one gold and my first transaction was charged an undisclosed fee, 3% for using a credit card. And then he said, they've got transaction fees for selling product that were only identified by email when I asked them directly. And then he kind of complains a little bit about uh, um, one gold support emails and he he um, said he couldn't make contact with an individual or sales representative and he wanted to do that but um, tell me about this three percent credit card fee like this is for people funding their accounts with credit cards right I mean well first and foremost we give you multiple methods to fund your account you can fund actually believe it or not with a check you can fund, which you know, amazing people still use checks today. You can use an e-check. You can use a bank wire. Um, and then for a credit card and Bitcoin, both of them, we do charge a fee, mainly because we pay a fee. Um, as you can imagine, my margin on this product is very, very, very small. I mean, I'm charging four cents over spot for silver. Um, so when you look at what I'm charging, I can't absorb credit card fees. And actually, in our industry, it's very common if you go to an Atmex website or any of my competition, it's very common that we actually charge for credit card usage because my gross margins on an Atmex.com are running 5 to 6%, and I've got to pay a credit card company 25 when you use one. So I just can't afford to absorb the cost of credit card. And then you add in the fraud and the, and the issues that come with it. Uh, we tend to charge 3% on one gold. We're actually charging 4% on, on Atmex. But for consumers who don't want to use a credit card, we recommend linking a bank account, bank account no fees, doing a check, no fees, bank wire, no fees, because we have no fees that come with that. Uh, so that's first and foremost. Uh, in terms of the service, I'm, I'm shocked. I mean, we we've, we've, we do a shopper approved. We're running a 4.8 right now. Anyone can go take a look at it. It's publicly visible. They're not filtered through. Uh, we, service is very, very, very important to us. And uh, I'm very disappointed to hear anyone had a bad experience from a service standpoint because that's a core function of who we are as a company. And, and uh, that should not be happening. And they can always reach out to me personally. Um, it's very simple. Kenneth.Lewis at atmex.com. And I will personally make sure a customer gets taken care of. That should never happen. Uh, finally, about hidden fees, you can go to right to our site. Pricing's right there. We're very transparent about our pricing. When we first launched, we actually had no markup. We were charging spot. Now we're charging, I believe it's 30 basis points, which depending on the price of metal can be $0.04 cents for silver, like I mentioned, a little over $3 for gold. Um, so we're charging 30 bips on the front end, and then we charge a storage fee per year. For silver, it's 30 bips per year. For gold, it's 12 bips. All very visible, very transparent right on the website. So there's no hidden fees anywhere. And anyone wants to show me proof of that, I'll, I'll take care of it. But I could assure you we're very transparent. Our FAQs, as an example, I want to say last thing I checked, they were running north of 100 pages long because we want to be known as that company that's transparent, takes care of customers, do what we say we're going to do. So I don't think you'll find a better price out there for silver or gold anywhere in the market. Even competitors selling a similar product to mine are charging more than we are at this stage of the game. Great. So basically the answer to that credit card thing is why on earth would you fund this account with a credit card when you could do like an ACH, <laughs> which charges you nothing? That, that really is the answer. I, I think I think it is. And look, we want convenience. Um, one of the things we do on our site that's very unique as well for, for precious metals you know when you go and buy a, a stock, you've got to fund your account with the money first, and then you can go execute the trade. We actually allow you to execute the trade and send the money in afterwards. So sometimes I think people think, oh, I need to, I want to do a credit card funding so I can real-time fund it, and then I can go, to, then I can go buy, buy, buy my gold and silver. You can actually buy your gold and silver on the front end. Say you're going to mail a check in or do an ACH, and you'll actually be able to send the funds after the trade, not before it. Another example of just giving it a real simple experience for customers. We don't want um, you know, anything to cause them not to want to fall through on a transaction. Uh, we want to make it very easy for them. Okay, so this same guy... He's asking about the proof of title based on the blockchain ledger, which when we interviewed Fraser, that was kind of a big deal uh, in that discussion. He, and, and here's what he says. Let me just read what he says here. He says, I can't find any information. He said, I can't find any information that supports the statements uh, by Fraser at the time that you receive proof of title based on the blockchain ledger. 
And he's also looking for support by the statements that the product can be redeemed directly through the Royal Canadian Mint or some other retail provider. So those, those two concerns. Well, I, again, I'm very surprised because right on your dashboard, if anyone wants to log in, again, you get $5 free to try this. So I challenge any of your listeners to give it a run. With your $5, you'll see right underneath your holdings, there's a link you can click to that will take you to the TradeWin website, which is the blockchain. And so what we've done here is our databases record your ownership. We also write everything to a blockchain held on an independent third-party system that you can access directly from our website. You can only access it if you're logged into your account naturally, but um, you could go out there to the blockchain and see your visible ownership at all times, and you'll see that it matches exactly what I'm showing you on our website as well. So that's very transparent. It's right there. It's a link right underneath your holdings uh, on your dashboard. So that's the first thing. And in terms of redemption, I mean, it's right on the side. It says redeem. Just click redeem, and you can pick any of the products we have to offer there. You can pay with it with your digital metal, and you can execute that, and it will ship same day. So I'm, I'm not real sure. I mean, it's almost like I wonder if the person is using our site or not. Um, but if they like, they can call our customer service, and we can walk them through it page by page and show them where these things are. That's great. You know, I, I was sure that there were simple, obvious answers. And I, w I went to the homepage. I knew there were answers to a couple of these. But real, real simple and obvious answers. Okay, here's another one. Uh, just just one more reader. So this guy has two issues. He said, um, what, what did he say? He said, I was told that I was buying and what was being stored were gold bars. However, if you go to redeem the bars, there is an additional premium on the bars. For some reason, that was a surprise to him. But you, what's the premium? Yeah, so let's be clear, right? So first and foremost, you're having a pool ownership. You're having a pool ownership of metal. We state this very clear on the front end. That's how you're getting the metal at such a low cost, right? You're, you're not, I mean, you're getting silver $4, over, four cents over spot. I can't get a silver bar fabricated for cheaper than 50 cents over spot. So, so you're getting pooled ownership of a broader metal source, if you will. So there are no, there are no exact serialized gold bars sitting in a, in a, in a cage that are yours. You're getting a part of ownership of a number of products or product in different conditions. Uh, could be in a smelting stage. It could be in a, in a melting stage. It can be literally where it's sitting in a blank stage or even in a finished goods. You're getting an ownership in metal that's, that the RCM is 100% telling you is present at all times. So that's, that's what you're getting. So when it comes time to actually convert to a physical product, you want mail to your home. There is a premium associated with that, just like there would be if you went to my retail website, admix.com, that sells physical. But what we've done for consumers is we give you our best to your price for anyone who buys digital metal and wants to buy physical, you can get the best tiered price we offer on the Atmex website. So an example is my best price for Gold Eagles, you got to buy 100 units to get that best price. For a person on one gold when they redeem, they can buy a Gold Eagle, one Gold Eagle, and get the best price I have on the Atmex website. And those premiums vary depending on the products you're going to buy, and I think people will find those premiums for physical are very competitive in the marketplace. Yeah, I just want everybody to listen like, you know, Ken is the boss. He knows the business. And he's saying a lot of stuff about how cheap it is to buy gold here and encouraging you to look around and see if anybody does it better. So, you, you, you know, either he's crazy or he's right. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's it's a little it's a little strange pe that people complain about fees or anything when you're obviously saying, go look elsewhere. Yeah, well, and more more importantly, Dan, and I, I really encourage people, we put a shopper approved, so after any transaction, consumers can leave feedback. Um, and if you go look into that, we're not able to take negative feedback and not show it. Um, just go to my site. I've got a 4.8 out of 5 rating. Uh, consumers are blown away by the ease of use. Just read their comments. I read them pretty much every day. I like to see what consumers are saying. Um, we're doing over 500 transactions a week, and we're only, what is this, our fifth month, really, of being live. Um, I think consumers are telling us it's a pretty, it's a pretty good product. So let's see. So what if you, if I redeem and I get it shipped to me, that's just like a regular shipping charge, right? Uh, yeah, actually, believe it or not, depending on whether you're shipping it to the U S it's free freight. Um, if you're shipping overseas, we have to charge a fee just because of the cost of getting it there. But in the U S it's free freight. So we're not charging you any freight and we're typically shipping it same day that you redeem. So the redemption process, what we did was we tried to mirror what Atmex is really good at on the physical side and give one gold customers that benefit when they redeem. 
uh, only 2% of our volume is being redeemed. So it's a very, very little amount of volume being redeemed. But that experience, uh, go use a product like Gold Money, and they use Shift Gold as their partner for uh, redemption. Go experience that process and tell me if my process isn't 10 times easier and more transparent. Um, and I hate to name names and competitors, but the point is when we looked at the marketplace, we wanted redemption to be super simple, no friction, always available to you, knowing very little people will select it in the process. But we're not going to make it hard on you. We're going to make it easy, transparent, and simple for you to do. All right. I just got a couple more of these. Um, one guy says he did business with a company called Bullion Direct, and they went out of business or filed bankruptcy or something and lost some money. And he says, you know, what would happen if you guys went out of business or filed bankruptcy? Yeah, it's a great question. And we've actually worked with Tradewind and the Royal Canadian Mint in this case to make sure consumers uh, understand their, their rights. And so it's on, our, it's on our website. We try to outline this for you. But basically, the beautiful thing about it is I can't sell metal that I don't own. And the only way I can own the metal is the RCM has to validate I have ownership of the metal. So the net of this is if I were to go bankrupt, all of the metal is still sitting at the RCM. The title is sitting there where the individual consumers, because of the blockchain, we know by identifier who owns what. And then we would work through the, the liquidation process, if you will, of taking that gold and, and being able to send it off to consumers uh, or give them credit back dollar-wise by liquidating the metal. So, so I can't sell metal. Let me repeat. I can't sell metal I don't own. That metal, that ownership is always documented by the Royal Canadian Mint on the blockchain. So there's no risk of metal disappearing in the process. It's just not possible. Uh, I'm also going to launch a product that's not with the Royal Canadian Mint that's actually sitting in my own vaults. When I do that, there will be a Lloyds of London contract that will protect consumers of any loss of physical inventory in the process. 100% or I wouldn't offer the product to you. We do not want consumers to feel any risk in this process. And unlike when you go out in your bank account and you have SEC restrictions on what they'll cover, uh, we're going to have no limits on that coverage. You're fully covered no matter what your dollar amount balance is at all times. You know, and this whole issue of who, you know, where the gold is sitting and who has custody of it, it kind of brings something up. Look, you and I both know a lot of people, thousands of people are listening to the sound of our voices right now. And I bet you a lot of them, if they like gold, at all. They like it for the tangibility and they like to have it in their possession, right? So when they hear it's stored in the Royal Canadian Mint, it feels a little far away or whatever. But the, the fact is, you and I both know, Ken, there is risk in taking possession of it, right? That you, you, If you take possession of uh, certainly of any quantity of gold, you have a couple coins around the house, that's one thing. But if you take possession of any meaningful quantity of gold, that's really risky, is it not? I mean, of course, I know what you're going to say, but you're right. Well, you know, it's funny. Remember, I'm in the physical space, and I do close to a billion dollars a year in physical. So, um, you know, we always say that there's three ways to own gold. There's, there's, digi there's paper, there's digital, and there's physical. And depending on the consumer and depending on their situation, each one of those products may be right for them. We look at physical. Physical people tend to not trust the financial systems, don't want the risk of um, not knowing what the financial systems are going to be doing down the road, feel like they want to be able to pass on their inheritance physically to their, to their, to their family members. One, always have the ability to liquidate metal at a local coin shop private, privately if they need to. So they have a very strong opinion about wanting the metal, if you will, off the grid. With that comes a couple challenges. One of them is obviously security within your own facility, your home. The second one is liquidation can be a little bit more um, cumbersome. It's, you know, you got to physically ship product or you got to physically take it in. Uh, matter of fact, on Atmax, we made it easy to liquidate because we, we give you a ship label, we cover the insurance. We try to make it simple if you want to do that. But again, it's just more cumbersome. On the digital front, as you can imagine, you can instantly buy and sell at all times. You can get into it at a lower price, and you're probably going to have a tighter spread as well. But you got to be comfortable with the concept that it's digital, you know, and, and not everyone can get their heads around that. What's beautiful about Atmax partnering with Sprott is you have the two largest players in alternative investments you're probably going to find on the market. Sprott has over $7 billion under management. I've sold over $15 billion in physical metal since we've been formed. So you're getting partners you know, you can trust. Uh, you know they're not going to have the case of probably going bankrupt. And if they did, they're going to protect you and find ways to make sure you're protected. So that makes our digital product a lot different than crypto, where you never heard of the companies out there. You don't know who you can trust. 
Um, and of course, I already mentioned the physical is always there. On the paper side, and not that your consumers are, don't already know this, but on the paper side, there are some challenges as well. They're charging 40 bips a year. Um, I'm charging 12 on gold as an example. Uh, so you got a cost of ownership deal. But also what I hate about paper is it sometimes doesn't trade to spot. It has a premium or discount at any given point in time. If you catch them on the wrong end, you can actually lose some money even though metal may be flat. So there's some challenges, and everyone says, is physical really backing paper, the paper product? Depending on the product you look at, I think there's some strong questions and doubts about that, and I think that concerns some people as well. So, look, all the products have their have their values depending on who you are and your situation. And when we built this digital, we just wanted to offer another way of owning metal. But physical has its merits, and some people swear by it, and we want to take care of those people, and we don't want to judge. Our job is to give you a number of ways to shop. Back in my old days at Home Depot, we realized – Shipping uh, online or selling online or selling in a store, those consumers who do both are your best customers. I think the consumers that buy physical and digital are going to be my best customers long term. So, Ken, why why start a business where you guys are handling the custody and not the mint? Is it just cost less? Yeah. What, are you, what are you trying to do there? So, so again, we hold the custody rather than the mint. Because the key there is we offer a storage product called Citadel where you buy Gold Eagles, you, you know, we'll, sing, we'll store it at Brinks in Salt Lake City, um, and you're good to go. The challenge with that is, is one, you got to buy fabricated products, so there's a bit of higher premium over spot for that. The second thing is i got to pay a fee to Brinks to store all that product as well. On a product we're selling at the Real Canadian Mint, it's the gold that's flowing through their operation at all times. So my cost of acquiring that product is much, much lower than a fabricated product. And my annual fees that I pay tend to be lower than what I have to pay a Brinks. So I can offer a better price to customers. So if pricing is important to you, I can offer you a better price. And then I still give you the ability to do redemption if you so, if you so choose down the road. So we think it's the best of all worlds. It's, it's you got a digitally, you got a physically backed product. It's got a very low cost. And you have the comfort of knowing that you're protected at all times in case you, if something happens. So we think it's a balancing act between the two. But again, you got to be comfortable with someone else holding your, you know, your assets. And not everyone's comfortable with that. Ken, is every facility that calls itself a mint necessarily engaged in the fabrication of product? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, uh, the Royal Canadian Mint's different that they, they do refining as well. Uh, a lot of mints will make blanks and stamp the product and then ship it out. Um, some mints, uh, I actually have a small mint myself, believe it or not, very small, uh, by the way, um, where we'll, we'll buy blanks and we'll fabricate the product ourselves. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll stamp the product ourselves with a design on it. Um, so I think a mint can have varying levels of capabilities. They, they can refine, they can, uh, they can make blanks, and then they can actually stamp the product with whatever goes on the product. And, and then between all that, there are LBMA approved mints, uh, which make a big difference in my mind um, in terms of quality and meeting a certain requirement or minimum requirement. They can be um, um, you know, approved from an ISO standpoint, uh, things like that. So yeah, mints not necessarily do all the same things. Um, and I frankly, I find that the, there's really mints that are kind of that I'm comfortable buying from, they're far and few between. There, there's, there's probably just a handful in the U.S. that I would buy from that I would feel comfortable with. Okay, so Ken, just a minor pet peeve on behalf of my listeners. I hate to leave things like like LBMA and ISO just kind of hanging unexplained. <laughs> just tell us what they are and, wh and why you care about them. Yeah, LBMA is a London is, – is, I can't remember exactly – London Bullion Market Association, I believe it was called. And what they do is they attempt to go out and make sure that certain refiners and mints meet certain quality standards and have appropriate um, a source of product tracks. So they know that it's you know, non-conflict type gold and silver. So whenever you hear LBMA approved, and also for the, the, the markets, the COMEX and, 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 and the London markets, these products meet certain conditions. Conditions that allow them to be traded um, on the markets as well. So it's uh, it's really important to find an LBMA approved mint or refiner uh, when a person does business with them. 
Nine times out of ten, those 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 individuals don't deal directly with the public. They deal with companies like myself. But uh, there's just a quality standard that comes with that. And then on the ISO side, I can't remember exactly what ISO stands for, but it's a it's a it's an organization where you go through and you get audited from an outside firm, where they check your procedures. Are you documented? Do you have fail safes? Um, are you meeting a certain standard at all times? And the way you produce uh, product is very common in the manufacturing space. Very common in the automotive space back in the day. And so companies pursue ISO certification, frankly, to give consumers confidence that you're offering a very high quality product that's consistent, scalable uh, on a day-in, day-out basis. And believe it or not, my Mint up in uh, up here north of the city here is actually ISO certified. I went through the whole process, spent a couple hundred thousand dollars to do that because I felt like for customers, you want to know you're doing business with someone who's been ISO certified. Yeah. What, what's on the coins you stamp at your Mint? Is it your face, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Um, believe it or not, a couple of weeks ago, we did a John Wick coin uh, for the movie um, and worked with the uh, the studio to do that. Um, we sold over 17,000 silver coins, and we actually uh, stamped those ourselves uh, as an example. Uh, we also have Nine Fine Mint branded product, which is a company that we call our mint um, that consumers can buy. And the intention here is not to be competing with the really large mints. It's meant to be a niche where we do kind of unique products that uh, consumers can purchase that you know hopefully meet their needs. Okay. So what prompted this asking about mints and things, when you talked about the flow through, and I realized you addressed this earlier too, and I meant to come back to it. The, the flow through of the Royal Canadian Mint, which gives you better pricing than I think you named what Brinks in Salt Lake City. What What is the difference there, really? What does that amount to? I don't quite get it. Yeah, so so think about it like this. Um, uh, mines send metal into an RCM for refining. RCM then refines that and has an output. They then typically fabricate that into bars that often will go into vaults that are then going to be used to trade on the exchanges. That's the most common form. Um, of how metal moves from you know a mine or excuse me a, you know from out of the ground through to the refining process gets fabricated and then ultimately shipped back out. So in that process, all that metal is moving through naturally through that process. So the Royal Canadian Mint or uh, wholesalers or even mines own that metal through that process. So I'll go to, I'll go to one of those partners and say hey I want to buy I want to buy some gold that has been uh, entered into the RCM process and they go no problem uh, we'll sell you that gold they'll sell me that gold oftentimes close to spot because that same metal remember is going to be ultimately be used to trade on the exchanges so I can buy metal through their operation at spot. If I go to buy gold bars that uh, are fabricated and I need to store at Brinks, I got to first pay anywhere from, you know, we'll call it 10 to $30 over spot just to get a, a metal bar to start with. Then Brinks is going to charge me a storage fee that will vary greatly depending on your size. But let's say a guy like me spends 10 to 15 basis points per year to store Brinks where the RCM won't charge me anything because it's a process of having the metal go through the process. So I'm getting metal at dramatically lower prices. I'm getting, um, I'm, I'm not having to pay for storage expenses at the end of the day. And, uh, and I'm able to pass it on to customers at a much lower cost. And so when you think about banks and wholesalers, that's how they trade metal. They trade at a very low cost. Right. So what you're describing to me sounds like this, you know, the LBMA and, and this, you know, the, the Royal Canadian Mint and everything you're describing. This is like the most liquid path from the mine to wherever. Therefore, it's the least cost. You nailed it. And, and the fact of the matter is, is a lot of times what happens, and you're going to see this when I launch a product here in the U.S., a lot of times the mints uh, or the mines, if you will, or the owners of the metal through the process of the RCM, a lot of times they're actually having to borrow money uh, against that metal. And so there's, there's a cost they're paying uh, of having to borrow against it. We're trying to work with partners to where uh, our customers can replace the banks. Let us own the metal. Rather than rather than have to have it from a, a you know a bank if you will, and and in turn give me even a better price, you know because now you're not having to pay the bank for that money you can give me even a better price, and so the product I'm looking to launch here soon that's going to be stored at Atmax is literally going to be a no cost no fee product 
that I can't quite do at the Real Canadian Mint yet, but we're working on it. But the product I'm going to launch here uh, in my vaults is going to be a product that will replace bank ownership and allow consumers to take that position instead of banks. And then in turn, you'll pay, you'll be able to buy a spot and pay no fees because a company like Atmex is avoiding paying financing charges to a bank and instead selling you that metal directly. So I think that's the future. I think you know allowing consumers to have a cost of ownership at levels that banks typically operate at, that's the future, and technology allows you to do that. It'd be very difficult to do this without the technology. Right, and, and what I hope the listener has gotten from this uh, discussion about all this, you know, LBMA and, you know, what is a mint and all this, you said you're the Amazon.com of bullion, and, you know, you've just explained to them in a way that they get. Um, it was very clear to me. I think it's going to be very clear to them why you're able to say this, how you're able to do this. And it makes a lot of sense. It's like this thing has been, I feel like it's been so long in coming, you know, to just be able to go online and buy a dollar's worth or five dollars worth of gold just like that at, at little cost. It, it surprises me actually that it took as long as it did. But if you understand the clunkiness of the process, it, it kind of makes sense, I guess. Well, and Dan, one thing for your consumers to know is down the road, because this model now gives you, it gives us the capability of doing other things down the road. So uh, I'll give you two examples of things we're working on. One is um, if you have a precious metals balance, let's say you have $50,000 in there, you're going to be able to borrow against that balance just like you can do a second mortgage on a home. And we're going to make that super simple. We're going to be able to click of a button because we've already done our AML. We already know who you are. We can trust you. We have the, we have the assets in hand. We're going to be able to loan money against your deposits that at rates are going to be far better than what the bank's loaning you money against a house on. And you're literally going to be able to do that with one or two clicks on your phone, right? Kind of like the rocket mortgage, but for, but for borrowing against your metal deposits. So people talk about yields or other ways to leverage their assets or investments in metal. That's a great example of something that will be live in the market before the year's out, I expect. We're working on that right now. The second thing that is, is not as attractive for the broader mass maybe, but the concept of being able to have a debit card to where you go in, you buy your groceries, and you let that gro the groceries be paid for in gold. So, so it's a little gimmicky in some ways, but at the same time, you have the ability now to have a broader position of metal and use it for everyday purchasing, just like metal was thousands of years ago. It was our currency. We're hoping to enable the ability to use a debit card and let gold or silver be your currency of choice when you're going into convenience stores or other places to make a purchase. So those are two examples of things that will be live in the market, I think. There are some products already out there doing something similar on the debit side. I'm not familiar with anything on the loan side. But those are two things you're going to be able to do in one gold, we hope, in the next 6 to 12 months at a minimum, and, uh, or a maximum, I should say. And that's just another way of making the digital product more attractive in the long run. Add to that currencies down the road that you're going to be able to convert into euros or, or yen or, or whatever you want to do. So one gold is meant to be a worldwide product that will, should attract people from all over the world who want to use it. Uh, so, so just think about those other features down the road that are coming because uh, I think that's also more merit for why maybe you want to leverage uh, a one gold account rather than going out and doing an ETF uh, through your brokerage account. All right, Ken. We are actually out of time, but if I could ask you to leave our listener with one thought, what might it be? You know, I, I think uh, just do your research. Uh, I appreciate the tough questions. Uh, we're transparent. Do your research. Uh, do your research on gold and does it work for you? Do your research on paper, digital, um, and physical. And then honestly, research uh, the customer or company you do business with. I think you're going to find that we're very proud of who we are. We've gotten to where we're at for a reason. But uh, do your research, and I think you're going to you can't go wrong. Perfect. Thank you for being here, Ken. I really appreciate it. You cleared up a lot of things for me and I know for our listeners as well. Well, thanks, man. And again, I, I want to make One Gold available or Atmax available going forward. So if there's any way they want to reach out to, to me or to my team directly, uh, we want to make that a possibility because we, we want people to be educated and we're a very transparent company. So I think we can do that. All right, Ken. Thanks for being here. I hope we'll talk to you soon sometime. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate the time, buddy. All right. You too. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Let's do the mailbag, all right? Time for the mailbag. 
Now look, the mailbag is important, right? This show is designed to be kind of a conversation between between you and I and and your part of the conversation happens in the mailbag. So please write in with thoughts, ideas, criticisms, politely <laughs> stated, and questions and anything else uh, at feedback at investorhour.com. Got a few good ones today. Let's get to it. So the first one is from Jerry F. And Jerry F. says, Dan, longtime listener and subscriber, I commend you for having your latest guest on. He was extremely well-informed about Bitcoin. He's talking about Mark Yusko last week. He was extremely well-informed about Bitcoin and even offered the best rebuttal uh, of various people's aversion to Bitcoin, namely that it has no intrinsic value. He illustrated that gold, while tangible, really does not have much intrinsic value either. I would love to have him back on as a guest to discuss what will happen to Bitcoin when there are no Bitcoins being created to pay miners who are providing the validation and block processing computational power. He's got some more stuff in here, but that was the bit I really wanted to get to. And I took that and I sent that to... Um, and, and that was expressed by some other listeners as well. So I took that and I sent it to Mr. Eric Wade. And he sent me back a reply. The plan is that once the block rewards for new blocks ends, expected to be in the year 2140, that miners will continue working to receive transaction fee rewards. Right now, they already receive those, but the block reward is big enough that the fees portion is a small percentage. You may have caught the fact that we have 100 plus years to worry about that. It's impossible to guess what type of innovations will happen in that time. But the plan is that miners will continue to be rewarded. For example, a recent block had 12.5 Bitcoin rewards for mining the block, plus 1.58 Bitcoin reward for the transaction fee inside the block. By the time 2140 rolls around, the fees will exceed the mining reward in theory. Uh, and then another guy was asking about anonymity. So I'll just throw that question in here too. He says, as for anonymity, another great question. But right now, at least anything that connects fiat to crypto will have the same problem, right? People were asking about anonymity. If you're, if you're uh, you know, redeeming Bitcoin for dollars and dollars for Bitcoin, I mean, the government's going to know what you're doing. You're reporting it. It's income, whatever. Um, and he said, Bitcoin maintains the anonymity by buying it and selling it, at least in the U.S. Uh, he says, but buying and selling it, at least in the U.S., is where you lose that, right? Anonymity is one facet of the value, but the U.S. laws limit how much of that we can enjoy. That's That's his answer to that. So a couple of issues there with Bitcoin. I hope you got all that. Uh, here's another, another question. Dan, this is uh, from John H. John H. says, thank you for introducing us to Mr. Yusko. Wow, what an impressive and informative interview. I've listened to every one of your podcasts since you assumed the role, and it was probably the most insightful interview across all asset sectors that I've heard. My question for you, I heard you say you bought Bitcoin for the first time. <laughs> I've been investing in Bitcoin for two years and wondered how you made that decision. You have been not only skeptical, but if I might say somewhat critical of anyone for investing in such a fad, I commend you for being willing to change your mind, but it would be helpful to better understand your rationale, why the change, who influenced your thinking. I thought Mr. Yusko's explanation about the question of the value of money in general and specifically blockchain technology was as good as I've ever heard. I appreciate the effort and intentionality of your work with the investor hour, John H. Thank you, John H. Look, I bought Bitcoin because, I don't know if you remember, within the past two podcasts, I dealt with a question where a listener said, I just don't feel like I can do as good a research until I have skin in the game. And I agree. And I've heard this from other investors. I heard it from Warren Buffett. I've heard him say in the past when he was a smaller investor, you know, he'd buy a few shares to get a company's annual report, right? You get skin in the game and it just kind of... It gives you more of an incentive to do better research. So I just bought a very small amount of Bitcoin recently because I want to know more about it. And and owning it gets me skin of the game, gets me that, you know, kind of incentive juice that I need. That's really the whole rationale for doing it. Um, you know, so it wasn't like somebody came to me and said, oh, Bitcoin, you know, you, you're, you're thinking about this all wrong. You got to have religion. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like that. So thank you, John H. Uh, let's do... 
a couple more of these. Um, now, the next one is from Rick M. And it's really long, so I won't read the whole thing. But he's basically saying he's been he's traded futures since 1983. And he said, um, I, I admit I got pretty riled up as you brought up again that you find no merit in technical trading. And then he tells me he's been doing it since 1983. He's made all kinds of money. Uh, you know, he's 100% technical trader. He says, I even use chart patterns. Yes, I use technical indicators. Let me make something clear here. I've tried to make this clear before, but uh, the message isn't getting through. And that, of course, is my fault. I'm not critical of anything except what I believe is very naive technical analysis. I think the average person who's doing this has not been doing it since 1983, like you have, Rick M. Uh, and they, you know, Rick says he made 70 grand one year trading, you know, basically, I assume this is like part time, right? I promise you that ain't the average result. The average result is probably closer to losing 70K uh, than making it. So that's really what I'm doing. I think, you know, in the position that I'm in, I just hear so much feedback over, you know, 20 odd years here uh, from people. And I'm pretty confident in saying there are a lot of people who are just not doing enough work. They don't do enough, you know, technical analysis. They don't do enough fundamental analysis. They don't do enough any of anything before they put real money, sometimes substantial sums of real money at work. And I'm trying to push back against that and tell them not to put the money to work until they've done the research and done the work um, and, you know, gained enough experience and know how to not lose money and know how to survive. You've survived and thrived, Rick M. And I appreciate your question. Um, and and Rick recommends that we have our own technical guy, Greg Diamond, on the program. And we will do that eventually, I promise you. He will be on here eventually. But I, I hope that answers the question. I'm not against this stuff. I'm just leery of readers believing that it's some kind of, you know, magic and not putting the real research and work into actually doing it the way you've been doing it since 1983. Okay, one more question, then we're done. Uh, this is a guy who's just gave me his initials, HR. He says, HR says, hello, Dan, just catching up on my reading, specifically Investor Hour episode 102. In it, you were discussing emotion in the market, and I have always been puzzled by this. I can say I have emotion. If the S&P is rising, I am generally happy. When it drops for three days in a row, I question why I did not sell before. And is this the next bear coming? I can understand that and accept it. However, as far as the market goes, is there really emotion? I base this question on several items. One, we can discount the volume from high frequency trading. It is mainly noise, and while it accounts for a great deal of volume, it is just liquidity. Two, I have always heard institutional traders make up 85% of the non-high frequency trading volume. Three, which leaves the individual investor at 10 to 15%. Given these last two assumptions, are there really emotions on the institutional side? If not, that would only leave the individual investor as emotion, as, you know, the emotion, what he's saying, the emotion in the market, right? Uh, I'll continue here. If his presence is only 10 to 15%, can the market really be said to be reacting on emotions? I am interested in your thoughts on this matter, HR. Thank you, HR. Excellent question. I would say institutional traders are human beings, period. They're, they're, not I, I don't think of them as any different from anybody else. We, you know, we had Daniel Crosby who wrote a really good book about um, behavioral investing on the program a few episodes ago, and, and he's done I think the best work on this. And he he does all this great work in his book and comes to the end and says, knowing all these behavioral biases and things doesn't matter and doesn't change anything. They're still at work in your in you every time you go into the market. And I, I quoted Nassim Taleb in my rant today. And Taleb said one of his big epiphanies was when he realized his emotions, he was never going to get his emotions out of it, ever. And he's a hugely successful trader. So um, I, I hear you, but I think I think that you're the assumption that the institutional folks are not trading on emotion is not correct. That's my answer. 
All right. That's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, listen, I, it's my privilege to come to you every week. I love doing this. I love the emails. I love doing rants. And, and I just love doing this for you. Um, so, you know, talk to us. Send us an email at feedback at investorhour.com. That's really where the, where the rubber hits the road between you and I. Okay, so you can go to www.investorhour.com. You can sign up for all the alerts, you know, for every episode. And I hope you'll do that. And I hope you'll come and talk to us or come and listen to us and talk to us through email next week. Okay, thanks a lot. Talk to you next week. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to investorhour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email at feedback at investorhour.com. This broadcast is provided for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansbury Investor Hour is produced by Stansbury Research and is copyrighted by the Stansbury Radio Network.